Welcome back to The Charismatic Voice, everyone. I am joined today by Mark Tremonti. Thank you so What's much. What's happening? Thanks for having <laughs> me. I'm excited. I am uh, I am really, really pumped to dive into so many different subjects with you. You like You have knowledge of guitar that's obviously immense. Your knowledge of voice also and the way you've morphed it from rock into this like schmoozy jazz is that's just incredible to me <laughs> and then you. I, you also have tons of family knowledge and like it just seems life knowledge is massive so thank you for being here so much <laughs> thank you for having me i'm excited about it <laughs> well um i have a, a a first question which is sort of a, a tradition here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift this. Usually it's tea or coffee, but instead I'm going to ask you today, what's your favorite holiday beverage? Um, favorite holiday beverage would have to be um, <laughs> beer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a holiday beverage, but uh, beer is good. Um, Do you like it when it's got like some, some spices in it, like holiday uh, beer? I'll try any kind of beer, really, but you know, yeah. That's if if we're having a holiday get together, I'm usually drinking beer, and maybe <laughs> may, maybe a shot of tequila mixed in. Ooh, beer yeah. and tequila! Whoa, I didn't That's know right. those went together. Yeah, they do if if you make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, um, happy holidays to you. Happy holidays to you. I uh, I have let's see, I've got some chai tea, so I'm going to continue to drink that as we're, yes. we're going here. But uh, since it's holidays time, let's just talk right away about the fact that you, yes, have, have I brought a my cool, tea. <laughs> tea. Wait, what kind of tea do you have? Uh, it was some kind of like um, relaxation tea or something. That's one of my wife's teas. I just grabbed it out of the door. But I was looking for a mug, and all of them are like pretty wife mugs. But I found one that says, absolute top bloke, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody gave that to me on tour. Uh, that, that is a good mug. Yeah. Do I make you nervous? Do you need relaxation tea to talk with me? That's Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> I just grabbed, you know, it was all these like women's health teas and I found this one. I'm like, all right, I don't need the women's health one. I'm going to take the uh, <laughs> the uh, relaxation tea for it. Oh my goodness. And it's a, the season where I think everything is supposed to feel relaxed ideally, but it's actually very uh, it was stressed, very much do a lot of things because... Yes. You're a musician and it's the holiday time. And so you're performing everywhere. You just released a Christmas album. Mm -hmm. How many performances do you have scheduled in, uh, in let's say, the month of December? How many holiday performances do you have scheduled? I just have one this December. Just the one? That's yeah. the big one in Orlando? Yeah. But that's – we're filming that one. We have, um, we have the choir. We have – it's like a 52-piece thing. It's going to be um, – 17 brass, you know, the guys from Sinatra's band, um, 23 stringed instruments, orchestra, we got percussion, timpani, and then a, a choir of eight people. And we're filming it and it's all, you know, the, the proceeds, we're trying to raise as much money as we can for the Smile with Stella clinic here with the show. And then I have three more shows scheduled in January for the same, with the same band. Oh, nice. Okay. But that is, that is a massive endeavor to coordinate all of those pieces. Yeah, and it's not uh, it's not something you really practice either. It's something you get up on stage, you give all the musicians their music, and you run through it once, and then you perform it. Really? So yeah. is that dress rehearsal like the same day, or is it the night before? Same day. Same day. Same Whoa. day. So yeah, you get to rehearse it one time before you do it. That's a <laughs> that's a very very intense process. Yeah, you know, in rock and roll, we could we can spend a month practicing for something and you know get every little thing right but with this stuff it's you get thrown to the wolves and you survive or you don't survive and it's it's fun i like it it's exciting it's very different you know it's not uh it's not something where i'm really picky about how everything sounds on stage because everything naturally acoustically sounds amazing so it's not something you need to spend hours tweaking the sound it's uh as long as you have an in i have one in ear in one in ear out and it's perfect yeah which is kind of what you got going on right now too like yeah a little exa exactly yeah that's exactly I what I do. I keep the right one on, the left one out. I do the opposite. Yeah. Well, <laughs> hey, you must be left-handed. No, I'm right-handed. I don't know. Yeah. I, this just, it just, I don't, my, I hear myself better through my right ear. Maybe my hearing is imbalanced. I don't know. That's, you know what, um, when I was performing for 
25 years, I was always stage left and the left monitor was always blasting my left ear. So I'm always very protective of my left ear. So I always oh. do whatever I can to keep that one quiet. So if it's super loud on stage, I'll switch it. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yep. Man, that's smart. Hmm. Hey, got to save the hearing. Right? That's one of the most important assets that you have. Mm -hmm. uh, is the choir, do they have like a separate rehearsal that they do ahead of time or does a band or is it, is this, sorry, I'm still on this like one time through and then perform. Yeah. My classical brain just doesn't, it doesn't want to accept that this might actually be a thing. Yeah, no, the choir gets the music beforehand so they can go over it before they get there. Okay. But <laughs> as far as rehearsing it with, with me and the rest of the band, they only have one time through. Um, but when I recorded this record up in Chicago, the choir we used was incredible. They just were given the sheet music and every little do, do, da, da, de, de, do, dum, every note that they had to hit, they were spot on first, first go. And it's, uh, first time I ever sang with the choir was singing the first Noel. So that was at 10 in the morning singing that with them. And that was quite a introduction to, you know, it's such an epic song with, with that choir. Um, it blew my mind. That's one of my favorite things I've ever gotten to do. It's interesting because a lot of the music on your album is uh, some some classics in there. You have like the Christmas song, but then you have mm -hmm. Christmas Morning, which is your original. Mm -hmm. And I think a choir would be able to pick up a lot of the classics without too much difficulty. But when you have original, it takes a – there's less familiarity, of course, that you get to mm -hmm. tap into. And was that one programmed for later in the recording process? No. We had – you know, we only had – four or five songs that we used the choir on. And that one, I remember when they sang that song for the first time, um, they were all giddy about it. You know, there was, there was four, four women and four men and the, the women were giggling like, Oh, it's so nice. They, they loved it from the first, yeah. you know, cause you see it on paper. Once you sing it and you hear the choir singing along with it, you don't really get it until you hear it. And, uh, uh, that was one of the moments where I was, me and the producer got really excited because after you see the response of strangers hearing something for the first time and performing it and getting excited about it, like, all right, we're on to something. So that was another fun moment in the studio. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It is a really, really sweet song. And I giggled too a bunch. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's, <laughs> writing a Christmas song is definitely a challenge. And it's, uh, it's something that my father had told me since I was a new musician or a new songwriter is like, you should write a Christmas song. That's something that will live on way past you and be a legacy piece for you. I'm like, dad, you can't be a rock and roll guy writing Christmas songs. It just, <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't work. The fan base just won't get it. And then uh, when I did the Sinatra thing, it opened the door for me to be able to, to do it. So finally I'm like, you know what? I'm going to write that Christmas song. And I'd sacrifice anything, come what might, for the sake of having you near, in spite of a warning voice that comes in the night and repeats, repeats in my ear. Don't you know, little fool, you never can win. Use your mentality, wake up to reality. But each time that I do, just the thought of you makes me stop before I begin. Cause I've got you under my skin. Um, I kind of did it by accident. I was singing in the house. Um, when I was practicing singing like Frank Sinatra, I was like, you know, I'm just going to start spitting out melodies just in the, in the, in the, um, vibe of Frank Sinatra and see what happens. And that was one of the first things I did was the da 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 So I sang that and um, the lyrics came out as a Christmas song and it must have been March or something when I was writing it. So it was just a lucky mistake, a lucky coincidence. <laughs> lucky coincidence. Why, why is rock not the place for a Christmas song? Uh, you know, people expect people in the rock genre to do big trans-siberian orchestra type of arrangements and um you know where's the guitar solo where's the heavy this you know i think twisted sister did some christmas stuff and king diamond did a christmas song but that's all rock and metal i wanted to do um i wanted to do traditional christmas old school stuff that re makes you remember your childhood and uh that's my favorite kind of christmas my favorite <laughs> kind of christmas is not rocked out christmas stuff I mm -hmm. did go to see Trans-Siberian Orchestra and it was awesome. 
<laughs> but as but as far as me performing, um, I like the old traditional Christmas stuff. There's something so sweet about that. Just some Nat King Cole. You're like, oh my gosh, it's Christmas. Oh, I time. was I was I was nervous to sing that song. You know, that's such a revered song by such a revered singer. Um, you know, I looked at Mel Torme's version because Mel Torme wrote that song, mm-hmm. and then I was like. I think I could probably cop Mel Torme's version better than Nat King Cole's, but Nat King Cole's is the iconic version. And so I'm offering a simple phrase to kids from 1 to 92. Although it's been said many times Many ways Merry Christmas To you So I did my best to look at his phrasing and, you know, try to do my best, do my best not to mess it up. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so when you're trying to sound like some of these iconic singers, right? Frank Sinatra or Nat King Cole um, mm-hmm. and, and others as well. But what do you do vocally to try and get to their sound? Uh, first thing I do is I will break out my computer. I'll listen to the song and I will write down phonetically how the song is sung. Ooh. So, so phonetically def- yes. define that. So, in, where Frank Sinatra will say appealed, he'll say it like appealed. So I spell it A P E E Y U L D, appealed. Mm-hmm. I won't spell it the way it's naturally spelled. I'll spell it the way it sounds. Um, that way, when I'm reading the lyrics and I'm learning it and getting it into my muscle memory, I'll sing it the way he's saying it. Um, it's like, um, gosh. Um, when he says four, he'll say four, you know, like, like a two syllable thing instead of four, four. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, so so um, I will just, like I said, that's my first step. I'll phonetically write down the lyrics and I'm not going to go Google the lyrics because the Google lyrics are never the same as the actual mm-hmm. song you're doing. And mm-hmm. then I will take, and then I will take the lyrics and I'll listen to their phrasing and I will pace the lyrics to how they pace it. So if it's, if it starts on the one, I'll leave it right there on the one. If it starts a little later, I'll, I'll hit space bar a couple of times and know that I have to wait a, a bar or a phrase before the lyric comes in. And I'll do that all throughout the song where I'll have the, the lyrics all scattered to how they phrase. And then I will listen to the um, vibrato usage, how fast or how slow it is. And I will write that over top of the word and I will pick the p- certain spot in the word where the vibrato will hit. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'll make a little mark for that. And then I'll listen to the the vowel pronunciation. You know, sometimes Sinatra will switch from um, an A to a U or something in the middle of, of uh, holding out a note. And I'll try to match that. And I'll even write that in my notes. Um, I can't think of an example. Like, um, gosh, there's he does it so many times. I'm just on the spot. I can't think of them. But there's a lot of times where he'll hold out a note and he'll change the vowel sound. Mm-hmm. Like so a I'll dip write, song where he'll have like in the word I, he'd be going I or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Or AU or so whatever it is, he'll change it so it so it um it, so he can throw a deeper vibrato, wider vibrato on the end or something. Mm-hmm. But um and I will so think of what what does this vibrato squiggle look like? Is it like do you usually just kind of go like that's or do you go well, <laughs> well, I'm so here's here's my Sinatra notebook, right? Mm-hmm. So I got my little picture of Frank. It's blue because he's uh, blue, old blue eyes. <laughs> and then here's here's my here's an example. So come, this is come fly with me. Um, and then I'll have pitch. You see this um, on come fly with me. Um, once I get you up there, when he sings that, the first time he does it. He stays flat on the one side, gets you up there. And then the second time it goes, once I get you up there, he, he rides the scale. So on those two, every time I'd sing, I'm like, there's something wrong with the first time I'm singing this. And then I realized after listening to it a hundred times, oh, he's sticking that note. You know, and sometimes when the melody's going da-da-da-da-da, you don't hear those little things, uh-huh. especially, when he, especially when he does it different on another line. So after a while of just singing it, 
And that, I still do that. I'll still sing these songs that I actually recorded on record. And I'll hear something. I'm like, this always bugs me. This one little thing. What am I not doing right? And I'll go back and I'll try to analyze why it's not syncing up with what he does. Um, and that being said, I try to do, at first I try to do exactly what um, another singer is doing and then put my own spin on it after the fact. But I do try to mimic it um, pretty close to what, they, what they've what they done. And I, it's much easier for me to do Frank Sinatra than it is Nat King Cole because Frank Sinatra's... Uh, the reason I did Frank Sinatra is because I felt like when I was singing along, it just fit my it fit my vocal register. It fit mm. my the the sound the, the the sound of my voice matched his better than um, almost any singer that I've sang along with. And I just it was a lucky it was just lucky that I fell in love with some of these songs and started singing them and just like wow, this is where my voice fits. You know, I couldn't do this with Chris Cornell. No. I couldn't do this. <laughs> I couldn't do it with Miles Kennedy or you know. Um, even Mel Torme, if I, um, if I find a singer like Mel Torme, who I absolutely love, he's about a whole step higher than I am. So I would have to t- take his song and pitch it down and then practice the same way. Um, oh. But, but Frank's key is my key really. And Frank is also just happens to be one of those people that every single voice teacher says, go sing along with that. Yeah. That worked out well. <laughs> a- abs- absolutely. And I, I, and I, you know, I think you just have to also love it. You know, you have to really love it. If you're just doing it as a homework project, you're not going to get all the nuances. And, um, you know, I went deep, deep into his catalog. And the more you, you do that, you realize, have you ever noticed when Frank Sinatra says the word B, it's like he lights up and goes B, you know, he, it's every <laughs> time he does here. that. He, yeah. He sings it with the, and I, I have this, oh, I don't have it in my book anymore, but I have the, um, he wrote a book called uh, tips for popular singing with his vocal teacher when he was very young and it has a chart, the diagram of all the vowel sounds and his B is, <laughs> you know, it's straight across. It's wide. So, yeah. Yeah. So I'll try, I tried to imitate some of that, but uh, that, that hasn't become a habit yet to go B. <laughs> <laughs> That's, it's so funny listening to you describe how you're phonetically approaching the music because my background in opera is a very, very similar approach, right? If I am going into a role for the first time, a lot of times it's in a different language. And even though I've been trained how to speak that language too, it's just so different when you sing it. Even if I'm doing an opera in English, like I still have to phonetically tear everything apart, break it down, and really understand when those vowels are switching. And I'm sure you're going to love this. One of the main things that I had to train in was IPA, which is not referring to a beer, or Christmas spirits, <laughs> International <laughs> Phonetic Alphabet. And and I swear, even these days, when I hear Frank Sinatra, anything I hear, rock singers included, I have IPA that sometimes is just rolling in my brain, phonetically trying to analyze when exactly a vowel is switching, yeah. how that animal, uh, how that animal, that vowel animal yeah. <laughs> is created, <Yeah. laughs> super wide, tall, all of those things. You, you just do it, but you've you've essentially found your own code. You've developed your own code, which is yeah, amazing. Yeah, I, I wasn't taught, you know. It was um, – I, t- I approached it the way I approached guitar. You know, you hear something that you want to do and you try to you try to look at every little nuance of how it's done and try to – you know, with the guitar, you can hear something and you're like, are they playing that on the D string or the G string? Well, no, it sounds like it's un, it's an unwound kind of sound. That must be on the G string. You figure out like over the years, you can hear things deeper. So I try to take the same approach with the vocals and listen to every little nuance, sing them an absolute thousand times over and over mm-hmm. and over again. I love it to begin with. Like I said, I don't think anybody's going to practice anything and get good at it unless they love it. Um, I loved it. I was practicing – so my this was during COVID when I was preparing for the record. My son mm-hmm. practiced. He was playing soccer and his he was on two teams. So he'd have back-to-back practices at an uh, hour and a half each. So three hours of practice, 45-minute drive to the field, 45-minute back. I, so I was practicing singing Frank Sinatra for hours and hours every single day, more than I was playing guitar at the time. And this is four hours of, of singing. Um, and uh, after a while, it just started – 
I remember driving home from these soccer practices. I remember driving to soccer practices and going, I got some work to do. On the way home from soccer practice, I'd be like, this feels good. I'm, I'm getting this. I'm, feel, I'm, I'm feeling this. Um, and day by day, it got better and better. I felt more and more comfortable. The repetition helped a ton. Um, pra- you know, just singing along with his vibrato helped a ton. Um, some people say he has a fast vibrato. I don't think. I think he's got a nice, perfect, smooth vibrato. Yeah, I'd say like medium to medium fast, but definitely not fast. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the slower vibrato is smaller. I think slower vibrato is better. I, I'm... I can't go much slower than Frank Sinatra vibrato. That feels natural to me. It's amazing that you have control over the rate of your vibrato in the first place because that's one of the more difficult things vocally to control, and many people just never can. So I think the fact that you're able to match vibrato speed is – honestly, it's kind of insane. That's really well, awesome. Only, well, only with – I can match his just because I'm singing along to it a million times. I try my best <laughs> to match his, but – if that being said, if I had to sing just like another singer's vibrato, I couldn't just immediately match it. I'd have to sit and sing it a thousand times and then let it become muscle memory, hopefully. But when I was younger, I couldn't do any vibrato at all. I used hmm. to be, I used to be so um, impressed with, you know, when you're a kid, I was in sixth, seventh grade and I was in a rock band and I was like, man, I wish I could sing. And I'd make demos and I'd be like, uh, you know. <laughs> you I, did the like larynx yeah, jiggle. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So, Amazing. And what I don't changed? remember. Oh. I don't remember knowing how to actually get it. I just one day could do it. Um, one thing that you could teach me how to do that I would. One thing that's a huge hole in my singing is I have no. Um, my falsetto sounds like a joke, a complete joke. Oh. I sang one by one one falsetto on this Christmas record, and that's in this Christmas. Mm-hmm. I hit one one note, and I can do that one decently, but I can't do it like Miles. I can't do it where it's. Uh, my my falsetto would go from big, huge, um, full voice to yeah, squeaky, Little, yeah. tiny voice, and I have no transition in between head voice, chest voice. Uh, it's one of the things love- that uh, that most people, when they're really playing with falsetto, I found uh, one of the like ends to it that works for like ninety percent is just working on the ooh vowel because ooh naturally is going to help you shift up there more easily. But there's mm-hmm. so much more after that. But I really think that the vowel choice, especially since you're so into vowel sounds, mm-hmm. I think that finding your optimal vowel for falsetto um, mm-hmm. can make everything from there easier. But if you're comparing yourself to Miles, <laughs> <laughs> you got a long, you got a long way to go, right? <laughs> His top is just insane. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. my gosh, yeah, I <laughs> that's that's crazy. But you've got like a nice. Uh, it's like, do you really need that? The answer, I think, is actually no, you don't. Because well, you just songwriter, put out two albums. I, <laughs> yeah, well, as a songwriter, I write in my falsetto. Um, mm. when, I'm, when I'm writing songs, I, <laughs> I, when I'm on tour, I do um, songwriting clinics. And I always tell people that are there, I'm like, listen, um, we're in the trust tree right now. I'm going to embarrass myself a little bit, but this is how I write. And I just want you to hear it. So... When I write a song, in my mind, I'm the best singer in the world, right? I, I, I am Robert Plant. I am this. I am that. I am the <laughs> best. And I'm singing in my falsetto. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm a nah. You know, I'm singing like like that because I can mm-hmm. hit every note. I don't have to be loud. Sometimes I'm in a hotel room. I can't be singing in full voice when I'm writing in a hotel yep. room. I can't if my kids are in the next room sleeping. I can't be screaming. So when I'm listening to all my ideas on GarageBand, sometimes I'll hear the falsetto, what I've done. I'm like, wow, I wish I could pull that off. Because if I could pull it off, it would be a magical song. But I have to shift it down to my voice, which has to go down to like F sharp or G from a standard tuning, which is a, a sloppy baritone thing. And mm. it's just not, it's not, uh, and it doesn't sound as good. But if I could sing up there and use that but that falsetto fully, I would be a well-rounded singer. And I just can't... Uh, I need to I need to find a local teacher that could get me better at it, but um, who knows? I so the other like other thing that I would immediately go to would be um, working on some SOVT exercises because it sounds like does it feel like it's gonna blow apart if you put more uh, weight into it? See, that's what I, I don't know. I don't know how much air I should put into it if I should try to be louder or quieter. Um, Uh because a lot of times when I'm hitting that, if I'm hitting that high note, I'm coming off, I'm, this is an epic moment. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm already singing loud. So if I go into a false note and gets quiet, it's anticlimactic. Yeah. Like, okay. So 
like vocal folds wise, right? Uh, most of the time you're singing with this sort of like full kind of contact if if we were to zoom in. So, right, like the air is going uh, this way, right? It's coming mm -hmm. up through your vocal folds. So they actually do this kind of movement. Mm -hmm. um, but as they get stretched more, they start to do this. And then um, falsetto, uh, it drops most of TA, which is thyroretinoid. That's the muscle on the sides of these. It drops that engagement and you just have CT that's stretching it. So you end up having this kind of action that's like this. It's very, very, very thin. Mm -hmm. More air naturally is escaping through it. But sometimes it can be hard for people, like they might need to train that CT to um, be able to bear a little bit more air pressure underneath because that extra air pressure is what creates more volume, mm -hmm. right? But that's that's hard if you've, you've got your vocal folds accommodated to doing this. Um, that means that your, your TAs are really what want to engage to help support that louder sound. But uh, like SOVT exercises are the go-to to help regulate that breath pressure um, on both sides, semi-occluded vocal tract exercises. So singing mm -hmm. through a straw, lip trills, right? This kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Doing that. But it, it, gosh, when you have a lifetime of understanding like the loud sound as being TA engagement, it can be really hard to sort of uh, yeah. break away on, from that. Unlearn, yeah. Unlearn, yeah. And as far as all those vocal exercises, um, I quit doing all the YouTube <laughs> vocal warm up things because I felt like when I did vocal warm ups, I probably did them too loud because it, it wore my mm. voice down a little bit. So I stopped. Oh, yeah. I, mm, the best vocal warm up in the world for me is singing Frank Sinatra songs because it, <laughs> it's, it's not pushing my voice. I've got you. You know, it's just soft. I've got you under my skin. I've got you deep in the heart of me So deep in my heart that you're really a part of me I've got you under my skin He gets up a little bit, but not, um, you know, not enough to, it just, it just gets the blood flowing, it gets it loose. Um, and I've rare, rarely lost my voice on stage. There's been a couple moments where I have to take a minute, but um, yeah, the vocal warmups and all those little exercises I never saw. I'm probably just not a seasoned um, vocal trained person, but I never saw the cause and effect of the of all the little exercises. I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm better served practicing singing, finding a singer that I love, finding a song that I love, and trying to mimic it, you know, and then that, that may bring that into the way I sing. That's awesome that you figured out something that really mm -hmm. works for you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I mean, the, the Sinatra thing really helped helped me a lot. I I believe that because if he does feel naturally close to your structure, to your voice, then it doesn't feel like you're having to manipulate things and get out of what's just there and available and, and opened up in the best way for you. Why would you mm -hmm. go try and do a whole bunch of warm-ups that are going to do something else when – that is exactly what you need to do. Yeah, yeah, that's that's how I feel. I'm glad you. I'm glad you agree. I don't <laughs> want to feel like I, I'm not doing something properly. Yeah, no, I I really I think that like science shows that SOVTs are really the solid great thing for any voice um, to do. But that can be just humming, which is like that's almost what Frank Sinatra feels right. It feels like gooey, um, yummy in your, in your vocal tract, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. This mmm kind of feeling. And I ultimately, it also is working off of often being a little quieter um, to build up some vocal efficiency. Because if mm -hmm. somebody's just blasting through a warm-up, that's not, that's not actually training a better technique most of the time. Yeah. I mean, well, whatever feels right naturally should, you know, if it, if it feels right, why not? Just do it, right? Yes, yes. I gotta, I gotta show you something cool. You know, Ooh. we're we're on this um, special episode where T is involved. Oh yes! Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh! Please talk to me about T. Did I of. take it out of my? Oh no! I I got you all psyched about it, and I took it out of my thing. I don't know where I put it. Um, so, anyways, I was singing. You can send me a my, picture. Just yes, say. when I get it. <laughs> So when I sang my first track for um, the Sinatra record, Mike Smith, who was, you know, 
Frank, one of Frank Sinatra's band leaders. Mm-hmm. He was in the studio and he cooked me up a pot of uh, tea exactly the way Frank Sinatra would do. So the same exact tea, the same amount of honey and whatever. And uh, so I kept the tea packet from that. Oh, my gosh. So uh. yeah, and I, also <laughs> he also warmed me up. Um, so back in the day, Bill Miller w- was his right hand man as piano player. And he would run mm-hmm. through scales and exercises with him. And I was telling Mike, I've searched everywhere and I can't find a Frank Sinatra vocal warm up. And he's like, this is what he would do. And he'd run me through the things. So I need to get, when I get with him again, I need to record that because uh, that's something that I think is important that the world needs to. Yes. No, this is Frank Sinatra. He's what did yes. he do to warm up? That's so Please. undocumented. Yeah. Please. I want to know that. <laughs> I yeah, would. It's a, it's undocumented. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Yes, I yeah. I absolutely think that the world should know that. That's so cool. Absolutely. So he ran you through that? He ran through, yeah, before we started. He just ran me through scales and it's like that's just what he would do backstage. Wow. That's mm-hmm. amazing. And then you got you got the tea. <laughs> the the exact tea. Yeah. And it had honey in it. Funny thing also is he's uh he goes, you know, I don't know if you smoke cigarettes or not, but the old man would smoke cigarettes before he tracked it. Whoa. To give a little bit of gravel. <laughs> I'm like, no, I, I I think that was, I think he just liked smoking. I don't know if that made his voice better. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, no. I'd say that probably if he was looking for a certain rasp, that could have maybe assisted in that. Yeah. You know what I've always thought about doing is um, you ever go out – and have a party a little too much, and then the next day your voice has a deeper register and it's all raspy. I've I've always wanted to record an album, get the vocals done, and then go in one day after a nice night of partying, and then track all the songs again with that that <laughs> day after drinking voice, and just see if there's any cool little things that happen. I was I was doing this um like uh, a library, a vocal library point, you know, where you sing one note and then another note and then just one pitch at a time, one vowel, mm. different lengths. So I was doing this for Impact Soundworks at one point to make a whole software instrument in my voice. Mm. And uh, those low notes, oh yeah, those were tracked like first thing in the morning. And uh, like if I could roll out of bed, not talk and just like 5 a.m. go into the booth that yeah. would do it. Uh-huh. Yeah. I wonder, <laughs> why is that? First thing in the morning, you can sing low. At nighttime, like the song Wave, I, when I practice that song in the morning to get the, the low note, uh-huh. I can hit it solid. At night, it gets airier and it disappears. Um, yep. If I've had a night of drinking, I can sing the hell out of that note the next day. But the high notes are gone. Now, there's a, there's a few reasons why that happens. I don't know if you're actually asking, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's just fascinating how you can sing so low in the morning. Yeah, there's actually um, there's more relaxation that will happen in all the muscles mm-hmm. here uh, while you're sleeping. Even if you're awake and not speaking, it still doesn't fully truly relax. And so, if you were to take a nap, you could probably sing right afterwards. And I've even heard of opera singers trying to do like a little cat nap before going on stage, oh. especially if they're a lower voice, which is kind of. Kind of crazy, yeah. but that's when you truly, truly relax. But you add to that things like uh, dehydration and probably a little bit of swelling in the mix, so the chords are going to be thicker, and that's just more mm. conducive to a lower sound as well. Oh, wow. So don't drink any water. Sleep. <laughs> yeah. All the things you're not supposed to do. That's right. <laughs> right? <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Hey, if not- it works for one day, of, one day of tracking, if it works, great. Exactly, for one day of tracking that's the way to do it. I've done some of those acapella things where you track your voice in different layers. And uh, that that is a strategy for me, for sure. Of like, oh, I'm going to try and get like a low A. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And that's how. There you go. That's so funny. Okay. Uh, I want to steer us. Let's, let's take us back a little bit to this like Christmas morning thing. Because yeah. in there, I had some questions. Yeah. Uh, there are so many cute family moments. And so you have three kids, right? You have two yes. sons and daughter, Stella, uh-huh. right? And then a, a wonderful wife, it seems like. And this is in the whole the whole music video. This is all cremation of y'all, right? Yep, yep. How nice it will be Little dreamers waiting for Christmas 
And now under the tree Is a prize just waiting for me In the morning the snow will be falling And no, my lady and me We'll make sure our children believe In the glory of Christmas morning Christmas morning And, there, and we look hilarious, I love it <laughs> Your eyebrows are on point. I, lo- I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a list at one point. Who are the other people on the list? So I think my manager, Tim Turnier, got on that list. He's on, <laughs> I, I don't know if he got on a naughty list or a nice list, but uh, I think it's just random friends of the, the guy who did the claymation. But um, he, I think he did an amazing job on that. You know, he sent pictures of the little village or the little um, streets of all the houses. And that's you know, a, bo- a big cardboard box about this big that he made little houses and all that stuff is legit. Like there's no, um, you know, that's not computer stuff. I think that's all captured individual shots of the claymation. And I think he did a great job. And I, I love it because that's my favorite childhood memories was watching, you know, the year without a Christmas, oh. uh, the year without a Santa Claus and all the, you know, the Island of Misfit toy, all the great Frosty the Snowmans and all those claymations, the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. That was Those are my right. favorite kids. So yeah. it was because of your childhood memories that you decided to do claymation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, That's the same reason sweet. I wanted the, the, the record to sound like it came from that era. I wanted, this, I wanted the song, the Christmas morning, to sound like it was written in the 50s. Now we come together every moment we hold dear. Cherish all the memories that we've made throughout the years Now we come together, hope we never drift apart Closer more than ever, the best gift It sounds like that. Yes, well, exactly. You. With a little extra clarity. Yeah. Modern. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I will not shut that down. I, I, I really like that extra clarity, but it definitely has that, that vintage kind of vibe going on. And when I was first listening to it and doing the first take, I also had no idea if it was going to be a, a Sinatra version or if it was going to be rock. So I was like, where are we going to end up here? <laughs> Very Sinatra. Just awesome. And, um, when you guys were putting together uh, versions of your kids, has this ever been something that you've wondered, is it okay if my child is out there in social media? I'm As a parent of a one-and-a-half-year-old who is struggling with this thought right now, <laughs> like, yeah. what did you think about that? Well, I didn't see the claymation video until it was pretty much done. You know, it was such a last, you know, it was going on for three months, but I would get, you know, a screenshot of this or that, oh. but I never saw the video until two days before it was released. So it's kind of one of those things it's like, well, I hope we like it because <laughs> it's coming out and there's, we're not going to be able to change it. Uh, so when we saw it, I loved it. It's um, you can't, you can't tell what somebody looks like from the claymation to real life in the video. But as far as, as far as putting your family out there on social media, I've always been protective about that. I haven't uh, Stella's kind of turned into a little celebrity though. She's has her own Instagram mm-hmm. and she's uh I think it's important for her because she has her own clinic. You know, she's, um, you know, she's the face and the name for this, you know, smile with Stella Tremonti Down syndrome clinic. Um, so she's, she's on TV. You know, I get, I get uh, people telling me all the time, I just saw your commercial. So there's commercials here in Orlando um, where she was, uh, you know, she got heart surgery at, um, at Arnold Palmer hospital and they did a big piece on her and they, you know, it's, it's, it's just a real nice thing they put together. And then we shot all kinds of stuff, um, for Advent health, which was where her clinic is. So she's, Mm -hmm. her face is out there. Everybody knows what Stella looks like. Um, my other boys, I just, you know, I just didn't know. I'd say it's probably just safer to kind of keep them, um, just keep family, keep personal stuff, personal. I've only put out one or two pictures of them over the years. Um, but I'm, 
extremely proud of my boys. They're the they're the best, you know. So I just I'll tag them and now. I now that they're older, I'll tag them on posts every now and then, and they'll be like, "Dad, I just got forty followers today." <laughs> <laughs> And they're they're like totally fine with this, right? Is dad yeah. cool, or is dad like like uh, dad? <laughs> no, dad is. Uh, you know, I don't. The kids their age aren't really music fans like we oh. were. They they like music, but they're not. Um, they're not like us, where we grew up putting posters on our walls and and go to a concert every week and obsess about records and listening to them all day long. They are into sports. They love mm-hmm. sports. That's their their thing. So when we just when we had the Texas Rangers playing our music for the World Series run, they just won the World Series and they were playing our songs in the stadium. They saw that all over ESPN, and then the Vikings started playing. Um, Kirk Cousins started playing higher uh, before they went out on the field and talked about it in the press conferences. So my kids were like, "Dad, Kirk Cousins is talking about your band and." <laughs> The Rangers. So when it comes to sports and when the sports uh, athletes are talking about your, their dad's music, that's when they get excited. So I'm finally, finally <laughs> cool to my boys. And I flew them out to one of the playoff games at the Rangers Stadium. So they got to go in the special um, entrance where the players would go in. And we got to go in the, you know, all the nice uh, box. And they got to meet the dude perfect guys in the box. So dad's finally cool. Oh, my goodness. But I, I do feel like that elevates the dad status. Right? Yeah. <laughs> wow. And uh, and they don't mind it when their dad is practicing Frank Sinatra for four hours during their basketball practice. No, my son Pearson, you know, he's the one that he would he's heard me sing Sinatra more than any human being. He would he would <laughs> listen the whole way there, and then um, I would practice in the car, and so I would park, and there's this big wall of a bush, and then there's the field, so they couldn't really see me. But he's like, Dad, the whole team can hear you singing in the car. <laughs> I'm like, oh no. So I would so I would park across the street and then sing <laughs> and then and then come back. But it's the absolute perfect place for me to practice. The car sounds so good. Um it's just the sounds all around you. Uh, when I practice, I don't know why, but when I practice, I like to put a hand like on my bridge like here somewhere so I can it helps me with my placement. It helps me with mm-hmm. my vibrato, just feeling the vibrations and like, I don't know what it is, but I'll sit in the car and I'll just kind of lean there and it, I can hear it better. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're so singing I, into your mask essentially. That's what you're Yeah. Doing, so I right? would just sit there and sing. Like even when I'm in the studio, I put my, I put my hands on my face somehow. It's almost like I, I it centers me. It centers my, huh. my pitch and my mm-hmm. vibrato and my uh, I don't know. It's just I even when I did the Sinatra thing or the Christmas record, the producer's like, "Why do you do that?" I'm like, ah, "It's just a comfort thing. It's like a, my comfort blanket." It, um, I would never do it live, but for practice, I do it. At some point, live, if we ever see you in a concert, do this. We'll know that you're just recentering. I do a part. I do a part of it. If I hold a mic, I'll kind of put as much of my thumb or <laughs> finger or whatever. You know, I'll connect. <laughs> I like I like the feel, the vibration of it, or the, I don't know what it is. So. No, I mean it is. It's it's a vibration that you're going towards or creating a focus point. That it makes sense in so many ways. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. Oh man, I feel like I have a, an insight anytime I see you live now. Like, oh, oh yeah, there it is. Well, he's doing it. He's doing it. <laughs> that's fun. And uh, how, especially because you are so involved in charity with Stella, um, how, what are the best ways that people can support charity? So I, everybody does it in their own way. Like I've, um, me and my wife have been 
we go to all the charity events that all come through town. You know, my wife is very good at keeping track of, um, you know, when all the charities come through town, we always go, we always get a table, we always donate. And my wife is always telling me, you should start your own charity. So I'd always be like, you know, I want to, if I was going to do something, I would do, I would rescue dogs. I I, I would, I want to find hundred acres somewhere and get vet, vets to come out and, and, and take care of the dogs. And just, mm. if a dog was going to be euthanized, take them to this field and just let them live the rest of their days. And she's like, yeah, do something for kids or do something for this or do that. I'm like, well, who's going to take care of the dogs though? There's no big, you know, I'm sure there are, I'm sure there's a thousand of them, but I didn't know what I was going to do. I was kind of just floating in the waters of giving, just, just donating to here and there. And then, um, as soon as we got the diagnosis that our daughter was going to be born with Down syndrome, it's just all the, all the lights went off. I'm like, this is, uh, the good light went off. It was, I was reading about Frank Sinatra, studying singing like Frank Sinatra. I was obsessed with Frank singing like Sinatra, watching his movies, reading his books, trying to get an insight into how he sang as much as I possibly could. And every, where you read, he was a very charitable guy. He raised, he helped raise over a billion dollars. And that billion today would be two billion. You know, he's he was a very charitable guy. He was the kind of guy that would call Dean Martin and Sammy Davis and all these other guys and say, come meet me here. We're going to get on my jet and we're going to go to Kansas City. And they're like, why? Don't ask me why. Just get on the jet. And he'd fly. And there's this one story where he landed and this fireman was severely injured. So he mm-hmm. flew in, did this fundraiser. About 4,000 people showed up. He said absolutely no press will be allowed to this thing. Nobody mentioned a word about it. I want the money to go to the family. Nobody mentioned me. It's not about that. So he's just a good guy. Well, you know, Frank Sinatra had his ups and downs. I'm sure there was days where people said, you know, he was tough on the set or this and that. But as far as being a a philanthropic person, he was. So Mm -hmm. when when we got the diagnosis, I was like, you know what? There's a reason why I've read so many things about him, him being philanthropic and me being obsessed with singing and Then all of a sudden we get this diagnosis. I call my manager and said, hey, I want to do a record singing Frank Sinatra songs, um, but I want to do it for charity. I want to do it for to raise money and awareness for Down syndrome. Let's call some local musicians. I want to find a few trumpet players. Um, I want to find, you know, a good percussionist, a piano player and this and that. And he's like, wait a minute. Why local guys? He's like, my guitar teacher growing up was Dan McIntyre, who toured with Frank Sinatra. I'm like, What? So all these, all the stars align. He called Dan. Dan set up a meeting with my manager, Mike Smith. Um, so Dan and Mike were the guitar player and alto sax band leader. And he's, he, Tim, my manager, told him what I wanted to do. And they're like, well, can he sing? <laughs> <laughs> my manager had never heard me sing Frank Sinatra. So he's just like, oh, of course he can sing. <laughs> Because he's my manager. He's got he's to stick up for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I went, uh, I remember I sent him a voice recording of Lady Luck. There you go. Oh. I sang it over the phone. I'm like, see, I can, you know, I've been practicing. So they set up, we set up a um, two song session in Chicago. Luck be a lady and that's life. Oh. That's what all the people say You're riding high in April Shot down in May But I know I'm gonna change that tune When I'm back on top, back on top in June I said that's life And the band, we all got along so great and um the band was so complimentary and made me feel very good about it. And we were, the band felt great about it. So we decided to record another 12 songs, I think it was. And then the toughest thing to do was, it was one thing we were doing it for charity. We're, we're recording these songs. We're, we got the, we got the band, we got Frank Sinatra's band (laughs) for the most part, but we didn't have the approval from the estate. And as you can, as you can imagine, Getting putting Frank Sinatra's likeness or name at all on a record is near impossible. Yeah. Um, I won't even mention the names of the other people that got that approvals, but it's only there's very very few. Yeah. So finally, 
And it took a lot of doing. It wasn't like, hey, we want to do this. Okay, here, you can do it. It was a lot of back and forth and a lot of proving ourselves and a lot of, um, we had to do a lot of our own arrangements. Um, so Charles Pignon, who runs the uh, family estate business, is like, you know, yeah, we, we you, you just can't be a sound alike. We don't want a Frank Sinatra song to come on. And it sounds a little bit like Frank, but it's like, it's not Frank. It's not, you know, you got to do your own version. I loved Frank's versions. I wanted to do them like Frank, but we had to take half the record and redo it. So my way, we did a nylon string acoustic guitar, made it more of a ballad. Mm -hmm. um, we took I Fall in Love Too Easily and we added a rhythm section. Uh, we took the song Is You and made it a jazzier version of, of the ballad that I loved so much. That's my only um, thing that I wish I could have done better on this record. The song is used probably the most important song on that record to me because I'd sing that to my daughter every day. I hear music when I look at you A beautiful theme of every dream I ever knew down deep in my heart I hear it play I feel it start Then melt away She loved that song. Oh. And we had to strip it. We had to make it more of a jazz version. The original version is a ballad with strings. Um, if you look on YouTube and look up um, the song is you... I think it's 1944 or 43, Sinatra did it. Down deep in my heart, I hear it say, is this the day? That's, that is the clip that made me want to do this. You know, I, I saw that and I was like, that's, I want to sing just like that. Mm -hmm. So my biggest regret is not doing it the way I loved it. So, mm -hmm. um, but like I said, we had to do, redo those songs. And once we did that, we got the approvals. And since then it's been, you know, one of the coolest moments I've had in this whole project is we got invited by Charles and, and, uh, Charles Pignon to go to the grand opening of the Frank Sinatra bar and grill in Nashville. Oh, wow. So Trisha Yearwood hosted it. Um, and then a bunch of other musicians performed. And then right before Trisha, I sang My Way. Oh, no. Oh, no, not me. I did it my way. For what is a man? What has he got? If not himself, then he has not to say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels the record shows I took the blows and did it my way So it was it was a satellite radio thing. So I did an interview with Trisha beforehand, and then I was a little nervous. Usually I don't get nervous for this stuff. I'm like, just put me in, I'll do it. But this time, um, Tina Sinatra was there, and I had just met her. And as I, she's the most wonderful person. She's such a just such a great person. But anyways, um, I had explained to her the cause and how much money we had raised. I said we raised over a million dollars our first year. I sh um, the reason it came up is she asked me what time it was and I pulled out my phone and she saw this Aww. and she's like, Oh my gosh, who's that? That's your daughter. Wow. She's precious. And I told her the story that we were opening the clinic in her name and we raised over a million dollars and she teared up a little bit. She was so moved by it. Um, she wants, she wanted to get involved with, you know, whatever we're doing um, charity wise. And then when I sang my way, she walked to the middle of the room and held my wife's hand as I sang my way. I was just like, Oh, 
<laughs> That's super sweet. Yeah, it was great. Oh it's tough. Word. It's moments like that. You're like, all right, sing, just sing. Don't get emotional. Just oh do it. Oh <laughs> right. And if I have a crack in my voice, it's okay in that moment. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. Oh, that is so sweet. You did such an amazing job at that album. Well, thank really you so much. It was a huge passion project. I mean, I spent more time preparing for that than anything I've done musically, for sure. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's impressive, especially considering you have like Alter, Bridge, and, and Creed behind you. And yeah, you know, writing. with those records, those are always, um, you know, you spend a lot of time on them, but I, I never, when I go into the studio to sing in those bands, I just go and sing. I write the lyrics, I write the melodies, and I just go sing it. With this, I sang it over and over a thousand times and got the placement and everything just, you know, as close as I could get it. And uh, I've you know, heard you with, say, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, with, as far as the music, the, you know, the music side of practicing for the guitar, usually, you know, that stuff is just learned from a lifetime of practice. You know, it's the solos that sometimes you have to, you have like a three-week window to get all the solos ready. So mm. that's three weeks of practicing really hard. But with this, this was three years of practicing really hard. Mm. You know? mm. There, I do think that there's just some evolution of the muscles in your larynx as you're getting ready for a role. Um, I, I think a lot about operatic roles, and I would not be able to turn one around in three weeks. It was brand new, as well as I could do it turned around in three years because yeah. it feels like your body is literally growing around that role. Mm -hmm. It's tough. Yeah. Um, but I've heard you say a few times now that Frank Sinatra just feels like very, very much that it's your home zone in your voice mm -hmm. and that you didn't need to do anything to get there. But then I also remember hearing you sing um, words darker than the uh, Alter Bridge, words darker than yeah. their, their wings. Yeah. Wings. Mm -hmm. Yes. Words darker than their wings. And you and Miles actually were blending amazingly well. And uh, it felt like that was a certain home zone. So I see, at least in my mind, I'm getting these two different sounds from you that both sound like home. Are you doing anything particular when you switch between those two sounds? Well, that that range there is is doable for me. I can still make it sound natural. Um, most of the time, I sing the rock and roll stuff. I'm singing out of my comfort zone because I'm I'm pushing. I'm push. I'm at the top of my range. Mm -hmm. It's not a it's not a nice smooth sound, um, but it's rock and roll. You know, it's, it's yeah. it suits it. You know, because I'm screaming half the time. <laughs> I, I I joked. I'm like I sing like a caveman when I'm doing that stuff. I'm not singing <laughs> like a trained singer. Like mm -hmm. when I'm doing the Sinatra stuff, I consider that completely two different things. When I'm singing rock and roll, when I'm singing Frank Sinatra, two different approaches, a hundred percent. You know, it's. I, 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 I never liked my rock and roll singing voice. That's why it took me 20 years to do my own thing. Um, I still don't like it. I'll still write something and I'll hear it back. I'm like, ah, I hate that. But when I sing the Sinatra stuff, I like it. You know, it just feels mm. good. Um, because I'm not forcing myself out of my range. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm playing on. It's funny how back in the days, the, the, the crooners, they. Oh, yeah for the first time focused on a deeper breathier voice and nowadays it's the opposite like the best the singers are going after the dynamic the huge the high notes and the and you know going through um a hundred notes in a, in a phrase and i can't do that stuff but i love that that style the old school crooner style and if you think about it they sang that way is because that was the first time ever that um, you had you could people could hear the tiny little nuances in your voice. Before that, I always make this joke when a musician like me can tell the kids, 
when we were young, we didn't have the internet. You know, we didn't have Instagram. We didn't have this. We had to, we didn't have Pro Tools, you know, until we had, you know, uh, my, I had my four track recorder. We didn't have GarageBand. Think about Frank Sinatra. When I was young and coming up, we didn't have microphones. We had to sing through megaphones on stage, you know, so they, they'd have, they'd have like just the things that old cheerleaders would use, you know, yep. um, they would sing through and then people would throw coins into them and then chip their teeth, you know? So, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Ooh. so I think Al Jolson was the big singer of the day back right mm-hmm. before microphones were invented. Al Jolson was a guy who would sing. I need to um, check that out. He'd sing he'd really sing loud. A megaphone. Yeah, oh, it's not so like that, opera singer. It's, it's a different kind of technique, and it's using the megaphone to project it. Yeah, so it wasn't mm-hmm. mic'd in any way. It was just that. So they would have to project to these big rooms, and then the microphone was invented, and then you have Bing Crosby coming into the world and, and, s- and singing. So it sounds like he's right here in your mm-hmm. ear, and he'd want to, and he would bring out the depth in the voice instead of the singing high. He would sing all, "Have yourself, <laughs> you know, a uh-huh. merry." That deep, rich voice, which you um, do well. But I think people take that for granted now. People want to sing high, and um, yeah, that's the desired thing. There's not a lot. You don't hear a lot of rock singers doing low, low thing. I mean, I can think of a couple, maybe Glenn Danzig. You know, oh, I don't know who, actually, who else. Yeah, I uh, I have like a little Christmas delivery that I think is about to to happen. Yeah. I think this is in honor of a of Christmas album here. That's perfect. <laughs> What? What is this? <laughs> is that your special Christmas tea? Um, this is this is not Christmas tea. This is actually, I mean, it could be Christmas tea, but it is a, it is a, <laughs> there's also some garland that's attached to it. <laughs> Thank you, honey. This wow. is amazing. It's a, he made some apple cider. The whole house smells like it. Wow. That's it's nice. like it's, it's like a Christmas time thing, guys. We're going to celebrate her, actually. I love this. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So um, this is a, to, like, yeah. Whoa. That's great. Wow. It, okay. Whoa. It's got some rum in there. Too bad I don't have tequila. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Perfect. Perfect. Oh my word! Drink. It's super hot too. I'm gonna let it cool off for just a little bit. Um, that's so sweet. I think he wanted to basically send a little Merry Christmas towards your direction as well. That's yes, well. Tell him thanks. I will. Oh man. Um, yeah, but you're. I I agree with you. I feel like it, it's almost like the whole industry has been trying to shift and understand this uh, high, loud, low, a little more intimate. It, it feels like it's actually kind of always been doing this ever since we really got microphones in and it hasn't really settled down we're we're still trying to figure out how exactly to use the technology to its fullest yeah i mean it's um it's definitely an, a never-ending quest to to mm-hmm. uh, you know i think once you get into really singing and really loving to sing then you go down the rabbit hole on microphones themselves mm-hmm. i went deep i went that went deep down that that rabbit hole and i found what I feel is the best vocal microphone in the universe. Oh, uh, really? So um, Paul Reed Smith was nice enough to, I went to his house, his studio, and we went through all his microphones. And Paul is an audiophile. He is crazy into um, some of the most unique stuff. So we went through his microphone co- uh, collection. Mm-hmm. And I was singing them one by one. And I, um, I came across this one mic. It looked like... So I went to his house and this mic just blew him all away. I mean, he had U47s and uh, you, you name it, everything, everything you'd ever want to sing through. And um, I, play, I sang through this. I'm like, can I, can I buy that from you? And he's like, nope, <laughs> but, but you can borrow it for the studio. So I sang, I sang on it and I did the mic shoot out in the studio. I had the U47. I had the what's it, C37. I forget. Uh, I forgot all the names of them now, but I had all the vintage mics and all the new mics and all of them. This blew them all away. It's called a Sheffield's Labs <gasps> mic. Uh huh. It looks like something some kid put together from Radio Whoa. Shack parts. It kind of does. There's, but there's only a couple dozen of them. This one says eight on it. Each one, of, each one was made with a pair. So I think I've, I've only seen like up to like 12 or 13. So there's only about 26 tops of these things. Paul just found one at a, um, an auction a producer had one so he bought another one and sold me the one i sang on so this is the one i sang the christmas record on 
and it's my, like I said, the best vocal mic I've ever heard. Um, Your vocal sound is is stunning, like, and, well, and that it is really captured perfectly. So, well, that. thank you. That mic, it just, I was having trouble singing, um, I forget what song it was. Everything felt good. Then I hit this one song and I, I just wasn't having a good day. And then I did another, vi I'm like, maybe the mic's just too clear. Maybe it's just whatever. And then I went back through the mics again. I'm like, nope, it's still the best mic. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's amazing. But it's called Sheffield Labs. I have heard of that. So mm -hmm. that, um, wow. Okay. I'm, uh, I've never actually gotten to sing into one. I'm going to look for an opportunity there. Yeah, absolutely. You would that's love awesome. it. I want to ask you a little bit about guitar stuff, if that's yeah, okay. Of course. Um, okay, so here's the thing. Like, I know tons about voice, and I know a lot about music, but classical music and acapella, mm -hmm. like, that's where I'm coming from. I am really, truly, as of what, about three years ago, that's uh, that's when a little like more like three and a half is when I started to get into rock and then metal eventually, and I just did not get guitar at first. Mm -hmm. So consider me like a baby in this yeah. area. I've been getting so into guitar. <laughs> like, I'm, it's just it, it's so it, it's snuck up on me somewhere to the point where I understand why people don't want me to pause during a guitar solo and talk about the music. <laughs> <laughs> that's great you know when you when you discover something later on in life it's like a newfound treasure that you can re you know um discover something as an adult it's great yeah exactly exactly it's sort of it's amazing it's an amazing journey what so if you were to name like maybe five guitarists that you feel are just cornerstone cornerstone guitarists in rock music maybe going into metal question mark um could you Name five, or it could be more too. Just can you rattle some off for me, so that way I can go listen to them if I haven't already. Uh well, when I when I think of the best guitar players, I think of the most emotive players. I'm not oh. necessarily when it comes to like metal guitar players. You know, there's not anybody that. Um, that's what I grew up on doing the doing the metal thing. So lately, I don't go. I want to find this new metal guitar player that's going to mm -hmm. inspire me. I go to like, I think some of the best players ever are, you know, Jeff Beck. You know, I think Jeff Beck is one of the most beautiful playing guitar players I've ever heard. Okay. I got to see him live. One of his first shows over to the States, I think it was like in 15 years or something, I saw him at the House of Blues here in Orlando, blew me away. Um, there's a new guitar player that I've seen more comments about being one of the best guitar players on earth. He's a young player. Everybody's talking about him. His name is Matteo Mancuso. <laughs> He is mind-blowingly good, classy. What? Yeah. He he learned how to play the guitar like a bass player. So he he has he rests his thumb and plays with his his fingers, and then he'll he has pretty much two two ways of pick. It's all about his mostly. What's mostly impressive about his playing is his right hand technique, and um, he doesn't use a pick. He uses all his fingers, but it's so absurdly good and clean. And he's not just shredding; he's playing. You know, he'll play like giant steps. He'll play like jazz stuff. He'll play some rock stuff, but it's it's really impressive. I would check him out. It's, um, um, even what, Steve Vai said, said he's. Oh yeah. Steve Vai said he's like the evolution of guitar. Oh. So imagine that compliment if you're. Wow. Mateo, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. And and I also want to know when you say it's good, like a lot of times. I'm trying to understand what makes a guitar solo good. I, I understand when it makes me feel something. I can understand like very creative melodies. Uh, uh, I'm, you know, I, I guess I'm such a newbie here. What makes this playing so good? You said clean was one of the words. Super clean. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, it's precise. It's clean. It's the note choice is great. It's impressive, you know, um, 
I mean, it's, it's awesome. It was one of those guitar players that uh, I, I follow all these sites that have all these instructional things. I'm always, mm-hmm. I'm always trying to learn every, every, every time I pick up guitar. And I ran into him on, um, I think it was, I don't want to get, I think Jam Track Central or some site. And I pulled it up and it said finger, finger style excellence or something. I forget the name of it was and I, what it was. And I love finger style playing. Mm-hmm. So I popped it in and usually these are set up where they'll have 30 licks and then you'll learn 30 licks and then they'll have solos that you learn. So I went, all right, let's start at the beginning and learn lick number one. Lick number one was already so hard. I just was like, nope. This Whoa. Is good. Just to learn that For one you. lick would have taken me six months to get the, you know, to get the dexterity and the, oh my the balance of, of your right hand. So it's, huh. he's very, he's very impressive. It's one of those things like. To get that good at that style, you have to start at a very, very young age, um, like like Derek Trucks. Derek Trucks is another one of my favorite guitar players in the world. What is he playing? He, uh, it's the, the Tedeschi Trucks band. Okay, I, I totally oh don't know gosh. anything about them. Okay, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. You need I know. listen. Listen. All right, li- listen <laughs> <I know. laughs> to uh, listen to uh, Midnight in Harlem. That's one of my favorite songs from them. Okay, Midnight in Harlem, Tedeschi Trucks Band. Um, Derek Trucks is one of the most, like I said, emotive players you'll ever hear. He's uh, it's so funny because he's so stoic. He'll just be on stage with just a straight face, and he'll be playing the most emotional thing you've ever heard in your life. And you know it's. He used to play in Tallahassee when I was going to college. The stories are that he was so young that he couldn't come into the bar until he was on stage. So he'd wait in the parking lot and then come in to play because he wasn't allowed in the bar because he was 14 years old. So he was touring when he was a young kid. And the reason why, one of the reasons why I think he's so good is because he, well, his uncle was in the Elman Brothers, I believe. And then, um, when he was young, he had a he was so little he couldn't get his hands around the guitar, so he used a slide. I guess the slide was easier for him to to use. So he became. I think he's the best slide player that's ever lived. Oh, I. Wow. It's all it's all opinions, but I'll stand by that. He's the best slide player that's ever lived. Wow. Um, there are other incredible slide players, but in, for for my vote, it would be Derek Trucks. I, I I know I have a guitar. I actually have two guitars in the background. There's one that's over there. Mm-hmm. That one I got off of Amazon years ago and literally never tuned it because it was supposed to just make horror sounds for video games. So it's like it's yes. for sound effects. It is not for playing. And the one over here, we actually had a patron make for my son. So when he's a little bit older, he still already like does this. But That's great. the idea is I really, I really want to. I think I want to take my son to guitar lessons. I think that'd be awesome to. You should. You should take him with him. <laughs> It would be so much fun. I would love it. Yeah. But that's, even though they're there, I still know very, very little. Uh, For example, Slash. Uh, Mm -hmm. This is only in the last few months that I've uh, listened to Slash, gotten into the music, and realized the incredible singability. When he's playing it, he sounds like he's singing more than any other guitar I've heard. It just, it sings. Absolutely. Crazy to me. And that's, is that what you're talking about when you say like it's emotive? Is the fact that it almost feels like a guitar is singing? I think the guitar is the mo- is the closest instrument to the human voice. I think if you can if you can manipulate it that way. I mean, I think alto sax has got its own voice. I think is incre- <laughs> I think that's incredible. Um, but I think between an alto sax and a guitar, I think the guitar takes the cake on the most. If you use it in the right way, the most emotive instrument, uh, the most the thing that you can make sound like the human voice, the the phrasing of it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why I love it so much, but it's, but that being said, there's something about singing that takes it over the top. I think all these instruments want to be as, as emotional as the human voice, but they all, the human voice is the best. So I think the instrument that you're already using is the top of the list. <laughs> you know, if you can be a great singer, I think that's the number one choice i think for a musician i think after that like i said what's gonna wh- what's gonna help you write music what instruments will help you write music you know it's hard mm. to write on, on a 
You know, am I going to write a, uh, I think you can write on every instrument. I don't want to downplay any instruments, but I think the guitar is a great one to be able to, to write on. Yeah. So if, if we kind of go back to these like cornerstone guitarists, uh, mm-hmm. one that immediately pops in my head is, uh, Randy Rhodes. And that's just, again, that was actually probably the sort of entry into, oh my gosh, I, I, I have so many feels in my body from listening to this solo right now. Um, Are there other guitarists kind of like that that just... Uh, especially from history, because I'm I'm going back right now. I'm trying to understand mm-hmm. how did guitar evolve. Yeah, well, it's um, you know, I think you had initially, um, you know, the Robert Johnsons of the world. And then it became the Eric Clapton's of the world. And I think guys like Uli John Roth were, you know, one of the first shredders, people to take like classical music and put it into rock and, you know. Well, what does he play in? Uli John Roth played for, I believe, uh, gosh, maybe the Scorpions for a little bit. Oh, uh, may- okay. Maybe, maybe UFO. <laughs> I just know him from just being Uli John Roth. I'm, 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 gosh, I can't remember what else. But he was one of the first guys to take. He he, he would take uh, like Richie Blackmore, you know. very like classical things and put them into the music. And then hmm. of course, Eddie Van Kalen. <laughs> and Randy Rhodes hit the scene. Randy Rhodes, I think, was much more of a uh, writer. Like he would write his solos out and play them exactly how he wrote them. Where Eddie Van Halen would just go in and improvise the most incredible solo in the world. And I wish I could be more like Eddie Van Halen in that regard. I write my solos like like uh, Randy Rhodes would, but I feel like that off the cuff soloing that Eddie Van Halen would do was the magic. I think that's. I feel like there's almost two types of guitar players. There's guys like myself who play for hours and hours and hours and hours, use a metronome, learn this exercise, learn this scale, learn this, and practice and practice and practice. And then you have the guys who just pick up the guitar, put on a backing track, and just jam and play and listen and vibe with the guitar. Those are the those are the BB Kings and the Slashes and the Stevie Rays. The other side is the Vies and the Satrianis and the you know people. The, and I, I feel like there's two, two sides and I, I've, I've, I'm so far on the one side, I've been trying to break through that other side for so many years. Um, like you said, it's kind of hard to unlearn things you've done your whole mm. life. So to become more loose and become just more, I think, um, like Miles is very good at just, um, playing in the moment and improvising and, um, you know, that's, that's always been a big strength of his, uh, but it's it's another learned thing. You got to put thousands of hours into it. That's that's so fascinating. I hadn't I didn't have any idea that there were these like 
two different processes that were really happening in different famous. That's how I think. That's how I think mm-hmm. of it. You know, I think I just <laughs> I, I, I've seen them over and over. I've seen those types of guitar players very strict or just vibey and cool. Mm-hmm. And there's good parts. There's good parts to both of those players. They both have their strengths. Um, and there are definitely people who do both. But um, I think the most important thing is to have that vibe and that feel and that careless that not careful but that that freedom with you know um when you when you say you hear slash and you can hear him sing through the guitar You can actually do that when you're playing the guitar. You can sing along to what you're doing. You know, da 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 da. You should be able to after you're playing a lot. You should be able to sing what you're what you're playing. You know, when you're doing fast arpeggios and stuff, you can't really sing that fast. You can go. It just sounds silly. <laughs> yep. But when you're playing bluesy pentatonic lines, um, if you've played for a few years, you should be able to know what it sounds like, what, when it, whatever note you're going to hit. Like if you listen to George Benson, he does that. And when he's playing on Broadway, he's humming mm. the, whole, the whole lead with his, he's humming the same thing he's playing on the guitar. And So you become one with the instrument, you know? Yeah. Do you think that your guitar playing has shifted because you've been singing so much Frank Sinatra? Uh, you know, the guitar guitar for me is always a constant um, adventure. It's a battle. You know, it's not something that ever was easy for me, ever. Um, everything I've learned is a, is a tough uphill battle, but I, but I just keep on going after it and going after it. It's uh, the funny thing is if if you were to tell me you're going to go play the biggest concert in the world and it's going to be televised tomorrow, I'd way rather go and sing Sinatra than play guitar. Whoa! I f- I feel way less pressure doing the Sinatra thing, and it it feels so much more natural with the guitar. The guitar is a, um, you know, it's 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 difficult sometimes. You know, it's not just something that you pick up and you just flow through it. You know, I wish I could be like that all the time, but. Um, if you're under pressure playing something that's difficult to play, that's can be stressful sometimes with the vocal, when you're singing Sinatra stuff, um, that to me is just, it's got more ease to it. I feel, I feel like under pressure, I perform better with that. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. There's so many people that, uh, you get under pressure and the vocal track will kind of close down and that just, it would destroy them. And, uh, on the other hand, I've also been the pianist who has had a ton of pressure and totally blinked how to play a song. Yeah. Yeah. So I understand both, uh, both sides and I find it fascinating that you would actually find it easier to sing Sinatra. I would never yeah. have expected that. The, the only thing that I think singing Sinatra wise that, um, when I do these, I do these shows and they're so far apart. Like I'll do a show, um, three months after another show. I don't do them back to back. If you do them back to back, you can get comfortable. You can get your you can, you can really focus on. It. <laughs> but it always takes me about eight songs to chill on stage. And when you're singing, um, I think I do Nancy with the laughing face like fourth in the set, and that's such a ballad. I sit down and I want the vibrato to be smooth, you know, smooth and slow. And sometimes it's hard to do that. You know, when you have when you have any kind of nerves, the vibrato doesn't want to <laughs> be smooth. So it takes me nope. a minute. So now I have to take my set and be like, all right, throw all the fast stuff first and then wait for the ballads for later. Have you ever noticed caffeine affecting your vibrato? I don't drink caffeine at all. At all? No, wow. no caffeine. Yeah. No, uh, this is caffeine-free tea. I don't drink coffee. I don't drink soda. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was that, I mean, that choice seems like it probably happened before you were doing a ton of singing. That, that yeah, no, I just never drank coffee and then I cut out sodas when I was young. It's just now now if I drink a Coke or something, it's just so syrupy and um, yeah. I love I love water. You know, <laughs> it's, that's a good healthy thing. I, I love um, – I, I rarely drink 
So if I uh, only time I will is if I'm if I'm partying or something, and somebody has a mixer, you know, or something. Mm. Give me give give me a vodka, mix it with some Sprite or something, you know. But that's the only time I'll drink it. Got it, got it. Yeah, the I I won't drink a coffee before I'm gonna sing an aria. It's just not gonna happen because mm. my vibrato, like yeah, it's kind of similar to being nervous. My vibrato will get a little out of control. It makes it yeah. very difficult to practice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that's it makes sense. If your body's jittery, your vibrato is going to be jittery. Yeah. And and we were talking about earlier how that's just one of the hardest things to control. So if you get nervous, it can really really go downhill real fast. That's amazing though. It it sounds like you found such a wonderful uh outlet of emotion that feels so comfortable and uh, easy to explore for you in Frank Sinatra. I love it. It's been one of the most um exciting things I've done in my career. And it's something I wish I could do more. I wish I could do more shows. Um, and I have, like I said, I have four shows scheduled right now, but I wish I had 40 shows scheduled. It's just, uh, mm. the hardest thing with this is I've got, when I perform, it's with 17 people. So I need to, I keep on telling the guys next time I rehearse, I want to set aside a smaller, maybe a six piece band or something. So I can do this more often. I can go play a small club and play, you know, like a 300 seat jazz club with a four piece or a five piece because mm -hmm. that's way more doable than dragging around 17 people because it's just the cost of it and the logistics of it are very tough. Yep. So that being said, if you listen to the Christmas record and you listen to Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas and the Christmas song. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light From now on all troubles will be out of sight Have yourself a merry little Christmas Those are done with just bass, drums, piano guitar so that's just a you know including me a five piece on those songs yeah that's your beginning right there yeah so nice I, I think it'd be great you could do my way that way you can do fly all you can do all these songs stripped down so in the in 2024 i i was peeking at your schedule and it looks like one of the things that correct me if i'm wrong i think one of the things i saw coming up was a cruise with creed yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. that's Okay, that's mind boggling that you're gonna go uh, like Sinatra happy for a little while, and then we're gonna go to cruise with Creed, and then I'm guessing we have lots of Alter Bridge stuff in there too. Like, how much time do you need to go back and forth between these different kinds of genres? It gets tough, you know. Like right now, if I didn't have the Sinatra show coming up, and that's it's a shame that it's just one show because I'm spending every yeah. day now. Just starting, I just started a couple of days ago. I'll sing through the whole set at least once a day, you know. So for 16, 17 days, I'll sing through the set. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I'll, if I so don't sing a song well or if I miss a phrasing thing or whatnot, I'll, I'll start it over and do it again. So sometimes I sing a song three times. I'll do that up until the show. But I should be writing a Tremonti record right now, which I am writing. Um, so I've got to balance my time. I've got a two-year-old baby that doesn't go to sleep until 8 o'clock. And I'm 100% um, at her beck and call all day long until 8 uh -huh. o'clock at night. So eight o'clock at night hits, I've got to balance singing uh, and then and then writing. So it's, uh, you know, but I love it. I love being busy. I love staying to on top of it all. Last thing I want to do is go into this show on the 16th and not be comfortable and prepared. So that's uh, one of my first priorities. But I can't go to the studio in February without a Tremonti record. So <laughs> gotta got to got to keep up that's it's just it seems like you'd really have to switch gears going between those two things yeah and the creed stuff you know that's happening in april so i'll spend a couple months before that just um you know there's a lot of stuff on the creed side of things that's um that doesn't stress me out but there's a handful of songs uh, like one last breath is uh it's one of those songs where if it's a clean guitar and there's a lot of fingers picked notes and it's just you and you're playing in front of eighteen thousand people you're like, don't miss a note. Please don't miss a note. So you got to get it under your, you got to spend time getting that muscle memory 
just right so you can get on stage and not worry about it. I know just a tiny bit about creep. This is not something I've gone down in a rabbit hole yet. Um, I know uh, with with arms wide open and higher, I think are the two. I was looking mm-hmm. over the. You said one last breath. One last breath is uh, from our third record. Mm-hmm. Okay, and yeah, it, but that, it features some mad uh, mad guitar. In, no, it's in there. just it's not mad guitar. It's just um, a finger style thing oh. that uh, when I'm playing live. And you have big distorted guitars, no matter how complicated it is. You don't really worry about it. You're just playing it. You're having fun. Mm -hmm. But when it's just you and there's no drums and there's no nothing, it's just your guitar and there's nothing else and it's clean and you can hear every note precisely. If you hit one wrong note, um, it could, it could, (laughs) if you hit one wrong note, then your mind goes, oh no, you hit a wrong note and then you'll hit another wrong note maybe. So, um, this is like the vocal cadenza, right? Like, like, and you have the whole orchestra cut out, and you're supposed to sing this beautiful cadenza has lots of running notes in it. Then come back in perfectly on pitch. Don't don't lose your tonal center at any point, and then uh, go up to a big high note at the end and be, you know, don't be flat. <laughs> yes, <laughs> have that yes. vibrato totally even. Cadenzas are the most scary part of any aria, yeah. and this is that's, so. This is your cadenza. <laughs> that's the same. That's the same thing, you know, okay. in the song. The song starts, and I used to, um, when we used to perform the song, I would tell uh, Scott, our singer, please come in on time, because if you don't come in on time, I got to do this twice as long, and this, <laughs> and for this set, this is my most stressful part of the whole set, so please come in on time, and half the time he'd forget, and he would just get in the vibe and the crowd cheer, because that's one of our biggest songs, and, um, you know, it's not, it's not hard, it's just... You know, for for everybody who plays guitar at home or they put up YouTube clips of them playing guitar, uh, it's it's much different when you're on stage, right? Like you're not you're not sitting in a chair, you're not perfectly relaxed, you're under you know, you're under pressure sometimes. And um that, you know, I think a lot of performing live is controlling that, controlling that adrenaline and just calming yourself down and and playing it properly. But when you have that when you have all that adrenaline and you're trying to play something that's stripped down and, and atmospheric and clean, that can be, you know, that can go wrong if you're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It, it, it just, it sounds like a cadenza. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Especially if that's that opening aria and it's, it's all pristine at the end. You're like, doesn't it remind you? Doesn't it remind you of when you were in class and you'd have to you'd go down the rows and everybody'd read a paragraph in school, and when your paragraph is coming, you're like, oh no, I don't want to do it. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> that's that's the, that's like when you're singing by yourself. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Gosh, anything that is really exposed when you're performing live, I think that that is just tough. Yes. Really tough. And kind of spotlight that's hard to handle, um, though it, I think it builds up a person in all kinds of interesting ways. Um, and actually, speaking of that, I did I have so many questions that are over to the side, by the way. Sure. We're going to touch on like a third of them. <laughs> <laughs> but there's this one that I am super passionate about that I wanted mm-hmm. to briefly talk with you about. Um, and that is essentially mental health with musicians, mm-hmm. uh, especially with lead singers a lot of times. It's incredibly difficult. And we see lead singers that um, struggle with depression, anxiety. Sometimes we get drugs thrown into the mix. We get a, a lot of a lot of problems. And I know you've been in situations where you've supported people in this in the past. 
Um, but then th we also have some people that just feel really level-headed. And I'm wondering, from your perspective of working with so many different musicians, do you think that singers struggle more on that sort of mental health spectrum, or is it just more publicly visible? Do you think instrumentalists are struggling just as much? Um, well, I could see why a singer would struggle more, and I've seen singers struggle more because they're um, – I would say that their mood swings swing with the, when you perform a song that you, that's about um, a traumatic experience and you're doing it every night. Um, you're, 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 you're swinging one way. And then later on you're singing this triumphant song that the crowd is singing and you just feel good about it. You, you're, you're, you're swinging a whole nother direction. And then the moment you step off. So, so imagine feeling this, the pain that you felt when you wrote a song with thousands of people and they're feeling it and you're going through that emotion. And then you play this upbeat song that everybody loves and you're feeling triumphant at the moment. And then the show stops and then it all shuts off and you're backstage and you're like, Hey, what are you going to do? Want to have a beer? Or, you know, it's like mm -hmm. when you, when you step off stage, I think all the people that are out in that crowd think backstage is just some great, you know, everybody's high five. And a lot of times you're just walking backstage like, Hey, yeah, cool. Nice um, show, man. Let's uh, what's the after show food. Um, all right, I'm just going to grab a shower and get on the bus. Uh, hopefully call the kids to see if they're not asleep yet. Or, you know, so there's a lot of range of emotions. And, the, and that's just, you know, imagine being the singer who has to convey those lyrics night after night after night. Like Miles has to sing Blackbird night after night to think about his friend who passed away. And he's got to believe in those lyrics every time he sings it because you can tell he does. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, you're a good performer is going to go to those places every single day when they're performing these songs. And like I said, you're, you're, you're something on stage that you're not when you're off stage. So you're living these two different worlds. When I'm on stage, it's like a light uh, switch goes off. When I'm off stage, I'm a shy uh, kind of person. When I'm on stage, I don't give it other than those, those couple moments. When I'm, mm -hmm. when I'm on stage, I have no worries in the world. It's like, uh, um, I'm a different person. I'm not who I am. I don't, I don't consider myself the same person when I'm on stage than when hmm. I'm off stage. Even my kids would be like, Dad, that's, that's totally not you when you're on stage. I'm like, yeah, it's not. It's almost well, like a, it's almost like a um, security blanket to yourself to get up there and be somebody else that nobody can judge in any way. You can just do this different thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but singers are the most exposed. Yeah. That makes sense. It's I think that a uh, singer wants to connect with the audience, wants to imbue their song with as much emotion as they possibly can, and that's so connected back to our emotional processing center. I know that um, I don't I don't do opera currently, but when I was uh, traveling and just doing it all the time, and like honestly, there were two years straight when I just played characters that died. <laughs> like, yeah. That was like that was emotionally tough. I think, oh, is that no, – I, I felt like I wondered if that was really just uh, only from a singer insider kind of view, which is why I wanted to ask you because I felt like you yeah. have a really balanced view on that. Well, I also think that when people age, singers um, – you know, it's, it's, I think it's tough to be a singer who's 20 years older and can't do what he used to do when he was younger. Mm -hmm. and, he goes, and he goes and he sees fans criticize that they can't sing like they did back in their 20s. And it's tough as an artist. You have to have thick skin as an artist. I've had days that uh, I've been really down because you'll read something and you're like, what an, you know, is that, un is that necessary for somebody to be that cruel to somebody online? You know, when I see anybody talking badly about anybody's music, it, it irritates me because you're like, you know, these people are writing from, from their hearts. They're writing the best they can. They're not trying to do something to be cool. They're, they're writing music because they believe in it. So for somebody to be overcritical when it's unnecessary, which I think the world right now is the worst it's ever been for that. You know, it's, it's people can be disgusting when they're behind their keyboards. Um, this is the yes. first, this is, this is the first 10 or 15 years that it's been happening and it's just going to get worse. People have become so rude to one another and I don't see it just in music. I see it everywhere. And it's, um, you know, take that into the conversation of a singer seeing all that feedback um 
when you, you know, maybe, you know, some of the, some of those issues come from seeing people not in their minds, not living up to who they once were. And then they see it reinforced by these people who feel empowered by their keyboards and want to blast somebody for having a bad night. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you on all points there. There have been times when I was recording an analysis of a song and if I, if I felt like I didn't have something positive to say, I'm just not going to release it. Like I'm not yeah, going to go mean, slam an artist. They have such a difficult job to do. Yeah. And, and there, you know, there's, there's definitely, um, you can definitely review things and, and, but do it in a classy way, you know, do it in an intelligent yeah. way. You know, if, if you don't, mm -hmm. if you right out of the gate, don't like something, um, pass it along to the next person, maybe somebody who gets it a little more to review it, you know, and it doesn't, mm -hmm. you don't have to have a glowing review for everything, but, um, you know, people just want to get nasty these days and it's, um, not everybody, but there's a lot of people that just yeah. want to get their, want to get their clickbait happening. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Um, I know, uh, for me, the charismatic voice community is so special because it's so positive. People are coming together to appreciate music, appreciate great singing. I love, love that. It is. Uh, yes. It's just amazing. It's one of the happy places on the internet. <laughs> yeah. And you can look at your fan base and be like, this is a classy group of people. You know, this yes. is the type of people you want watching your videos. Yeah. Exactly. And actually, speaking of them, I want to, I have a few patron questions for you. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect transition. See, I told you one third of the questions I've written down. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, from Andrew Warwick. Did you have an aha moment when looking back at your life or an event which spurred you on to the path of being a musician professionally? An aha moment. Um, geez. No, I just always, um, I always knew it. You know, it's one of those things. You ever, you ever read that book? Uh, gosh, was it, it's called The Answer. Or I forget what it was called, but it was about if you believe something, it will manifest itself eventually. I forget. It was the secret. I think it the was the secret. Called. Yep, that's the what secret. It was. Uh huh. So, <laughs> laugh. You know, if people, you know, I don't believe a hundred percent in that kind of thing, but that's kind of the way I approached music. I remember working. Um, I washed cars. I was a bus boy. Then I worked as a fry cook, and I was a cook at Chili's for five years. And I boxed this car. I had terrible jobs, but in my mind, I was like, I only have to do this for now. Because eventually I'm going to be, I'm going to get a record deal and I'm going to be on tour and I'm going to do the things I've always wanted to do because that's what I'm driven to do. That's all I mm -hmm. want to do. And I never, for some reason, I just never doubted it. I just wanted it. I just like, why is it not happening now? It's going to, um, my naive self, uh, it all worked out, you know, thank, <laughs> thank goodness it worked out. And, uh. I feel it like having a little bit of naivety probably actually helped in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I didn't, I didn't, um, it wasn't in my mind that it was nearly impossible to have uh, a successful uh, music career, which it is very tough, especially yeah. nowadays to have a successful music career. But in my mind, it wasn't impossible. It was just something that was going to happen eventually if I worked hard enough and I, I got into 16 different bands, eventually something was going to happen. Um, and I was working at Chili's in Tallahassee and I was going to school for finance at Florida State University. I went to Clemson and I went to Florida State and I remember it was final season and we got a record deal. Uh, we played a local bar and we got a record deal and I was studying for my finals and all my friends are going out partying and I'm sitting there reading a book. I'm like, you know what? I have a record deal. I'm, I'm going to come back to these finals and I didn't take the finals. <laughs> <laughs> and thank goodness my career worked out. Um, yeah. But to answer the question, no, there wasn't a, um, a light going off that led me to the music career. It was just the only thing I ever wanted to do. There was nothing else I would have done. Studying finance in college was a backup plan if nothing were, were to go right. But I, I thought it was going to, uh, with, with hard work, it would pan out in some way. And it didn't. That's thank awesome. Thank goodness. See, we have from uh, Ghost Knight, Mark. I love how you brought the guitar solo back after the grunge days. Who were the guitarists that inspired you and what influences helped you shape your style of playing and songwriting? Geez, so I, I'm, a, I'm a mixture between 70s soft rock and speed metal. Um, so I, I grew up listening to Rod Stewart, Jerry Rafferty, 
even Journey in the 80s. You know, I love those big choruses. And then you stumble upon my brother lived upstairs and he would play Slayer and Iron Maiden and ACDC and all the, any metal. So I loved both. I remember one night I couldn't fall asleep and I, I was like, Dan, what, what is that song about a sanitarium? And he gave me the Master of Puppets record and it was Welcome Home Sanitarium. And I listened to that record and that's the moment the light switch went off and on. And I was like, I'm a fanatic of music now. I want to find the heaviest, coolest. So from that point on, I've, the next band I discovered, I think, was Slayer, and that blew me away. I think Rain and Blood's got some of the best guitar riffs ever written on a record. Um, then I got really into Celt Celtic Frost, which is probably my Metallica and Celtic Frost. Celt it's Celtic and Celtic. I, I've always called them Celtic since I was, since I was a kid, and I ran into uh, uh, Tom, the singer, Tom G. Warrior. I'm like, is it Celtic or Celtic? He's like, it's whatever you want. I'm like, All right, <laughs> I'll keep Celtic. So um, I like them for their moods they set and their core progressions. Um, but at the same time, I liked um, stuff like watching the movie Crossroads and seeing Steve I play, you know, and Ralph Macchio play the classical piece and Steve I shred and, and watching Back to the Future where Michael J. Fox is playing guitar at the dance where his parents are, you know, falling in love. I was a big mixture. You know, I was never just one genre. I've always had an open mind to music. I like all different styles. I'm not the kind of guy that just likes heavy metal. I love heavy metal. Heavy metal is probably the music that I loved the most when I was a kid. But to be honest, now I listen mostly to um, probably big band jazz. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's just like you discovering the guitar as an adult. I discovered big band jazz as an adult. And now you, you, you realize how incredible it was. Uh, it makes me feel good. You know, it's not the kind of music you listen to and go, yes, it's the kind of music you listen to and it just puts you in a good mood and you can have it on in the background all the time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> As an avid swing dancer, I didn't have mentioned this before, but I like started swing dancing when I was 13 and uh, did it competitively for a while as well and taught it for like, oh my gosh, over 15 years. So, um, yeah. Swing dancer. Uh, I love big yes. band jazz. I love it yeah. in the background. I still listen to a lot of jazz in the background. And actually, uh, it's a specific kind of dance called Balboa that mm -hmm. I would often, uh, when my, my baby was like a little tiny and you're, you know, three o'clock in the morning and he's not going to sleep, yeah. I would do like some Balboa footwork and that seemed to be the thing that <laughs> pulled him to sleep the most. <laughs> So. That's great. That's awesome. I'm sure. I'm sure when he grows up, hopefully you, you dance that with him when he grows up, and he'll feel comfortable, com comforted by it. I hope so. But yes, I, I hear you on like all of these levels. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. I mean, thank you for going through so many um, different uh, guitarists and influences there too, because that's all food for my brain to think about going into and analyzing more in my journey. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Joe wants to know, your songwriting is stunningly beautiful and A, B, in loving memory. What was the thought process in having Miles sing that rather than yourself? And overall, how do you approach your vocals in A, B versus your other projects? How do you approach guitar playing uh, in that versus other projects as well? So when I wrote In Loving Memory, um, I was still in the mindset that I couldn't sing. And I spent most of my career not liking my voice. So I wouldn't sing. I always felt like when I wrote a song, it wouldn't see its full potential unless a good singer was singing it. I still feel that way a lot. When I'm writing songs now for Tremonti and Ultra Bridge, I will, if I love a song and in my head, it sounds great. And when I'm singing it, it falsetto, the melodies and everything sounds great. But when I sing it in my full voice, it doesn't sound great. That's when I might set it aside for Ultra Bridge because I know Miles will be able to sing it way better. But now I'll come home and it's not the same, no it feels empty and alone Yeah. 
And then, um, you know, as far as the writing go differs, when I'm writing for Tremonti, uh, well, when I'm writing for all, I, I, if it's a heavy metal, speed metal thing, usually it goes to Tremonti. You know, Ultra Bridge is, is more of a hard rock. It has metal influences, but it's not a speed metal thing. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever whenever I play a speed metal thing for uh, Brian and Scott and Ultra Bridge, they kind of look at me funny like, uh, what, what do you want us to do? We, they don't do that. Uh, you know, Scott's not a huge double bass guy. He's more of a feel. Po he's the best pocket drummer, you know, you'll ever hear. He's, he's, he's an amazing drummer, but he's definitely not a... Um, you know, you're not going to hear Scott playing Gojira songs. He's not going to be doing double kicks through the whole song. It's just not his style. So mm -hmm. that is something that I grew up on. So I like to do that in my other band, Tremonti. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's awesome. <laughs> Sorry, that was also <laughs> really, really uh, insightful. A pocket <laughs> drummer. I was like, oh, that's an interesting. I understand that term and just instinctually. Whoa, that's uh, sorry. <laughs> like, oh, very yeah. excited about that term. Okay, <laughs> we have from Zanaxa. I'm curious if any of your children play instruments, and if you're open to discussing it, did Stella benefit from music therapy? Yeah, you know, when my son Austin was very young, he was. We took him to the Blue Man Group, and he loved it. And we we brought we bought the DVD, and we would play it at home. <laughs> and and I got him some drumsticks, and he would imitate the drums on the couch, perfectly. He was so good. I was like, you know what? I think I have a little little incredible drummer here on my hands. So I bought him a drum set, and then he stopped playing because we'd always be like, hey, be quiet. You know, the baby's sleeping. And when Pearson, Aww. his younger brother, was born. Because he had the loud drum set, he'd have to stop playing. And then it eventually scared him off from playing drums and he never played again. Um, but he was very good when he was young. And then with both of my kids, I taught them how to play uh, a little bit of the guitar. Like I, we went to go see the Iron Man movie when it was out and I showed them how to play it. Um, and they looked at me like, wow, I can actually do it. You know, uh, easiest thing to do on the guitar, one of the coolest, most memorable things. So they loved it. So I put a guitar and an amplifier in their bedroom. I'm like, I'm not going to ask you to practice. My parents didn't ask me to practice. I wanted to practice. If you want it, you got to you got to earn it. So it's you have a guitar, you have an amp, you got you have no excuses. If you ever want to ask me any question, I'm here at any time to ask to help you out along the way. They just never kept up with it. Hmm. They were more they were more into sports. Um, an instrument should not be something that you force upon a kid. It should be something that the kid almost doesn't want to do their homework because they want to play their instrument. Doesn't do this because they want to play their instrument. You know, you know that they want to, they'll do anything to play the instrument. That's how you become a great player. Not by, Hey, you got to spend an hour on your piano tonight. You know, maybe when they're young children and then they, they fall in love with it eventually. But as far as, you know, the guitar, I felt like if they want it, they're going to, go after it themselves and they just didn't. Mm -hmm. Stella, st st music is Stella's favorite thing. She, uh, so my daily routine with Stella is she'll wake up and um, I'll take her on a walk through the neighborhood and we walk for like 40 minutes. And as soon as we start walking, she'll look back at me and go more, 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 more. She wants me to play music. So I play her, uh, she knows Frank Sinatra songs so well. I'll sing um, "You're on a date with," and she go "Me." The Pickens, <laughs> ha <laughs> the Pickens have been lush, so she knows all the words, um, and she just loves them. You're on this date with me. The Pickens have been lush, and yet before this evening is over, you might give me the brush. You might forget your manners 
you might refuse to stay. And so the best that I can do is pray. As soon as I start any of the songs, she just smiles. Um, and she, of course, loves, she'll just walk around the house and go, the bus, which means, which means play wheels on the bus or uh, oh. E-I-E-I-O. Yeah, you know, so you, you're, <laughs> she, she constantly wants music. Music makes her happy. So hopefully oh, when she's old enough, she'll, I want her to become a singer because um, people with Down syndrome have a tougher time communicating. Sometimes it's, it's tough to pronounce things as well. So I think singing for her will, will be very well for her, do well for her communication. And uh, she's learning to sign at, at the same time as she's talking. So I think singing will be pretty epic for her to do. Yeah, that, that's awesome. My, I, my little boy has been learning to sign too at the same time. And um, yeah. that's such a cool way of uh, developing communication. And yeah. yes, singing. I love that. Oh, that's beautiful. That's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question is actually from Kirk, my husband. Yes. <laughs> it's a big discussion, okay. <laughs> How do you handle Santa Claus in your household? And at what age do you let your kids watch <laughs> the greatest Christmas movie ever, Die Hard? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my kids are allowed to watch whatever they want now because oh. they're eight, 18 and 15. And by the time you're, by the time I was 15, I had seen every everything, you know, so I wasn't, so with them, they're, smart, mature kids, they can watch what they want. Um, but as far as Stella goes, I thought the question was going to be when you tell them Santa Claus isn't well, real. That's, that's part of, that's, how do you handle Santa Claus? That, so that's part, part A is. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. So I hope, I hope nobody's <laughs> watching this podcast that's believes in Santa Claus. <laughs> uh, oh, I totally spoiled it when I was analyzing Christmas morning, by the way, I had a moment where I was oh, like, oh go. my gosh, <laughs> I didn't just ruin your kids. <laughs> Uh, I, th I think the kids, my kids, um, learned it from school, you know, their friends oh. told them. Yeah. So we didn't have to deal with that at all, but my kids never told me they didn't believe in Santa Claus. They just went along with it because I think they, uh, Presents. don't, it's like, don't, don't believe, don't receive. Right. Exactly. It, yeah. Stop believing, stop getting extra presents. Why would you stop yeah. believing? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So we didn't have to deal with it. It just kind of happened naturally. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Good to know. Did they did they ever like express any feelings of betrayal? <laughs> no, you <laughs> son of a. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, they uh, they didn't even bring um, it up. It was never even an issue. It's just one day they just knew that we knew they didn't believe. <laughs> and and I think when you're the younger brother, you're kind of shafted because your older brother spoils it for you. Yeah. Yep. Yep. When oh. I was very young, we would my my brothers found where my parents would hide the Christmas presents in the attic. So I remember I was maybe in second or third grade, and I knew Santa Claus wasn't real anymore. Okay, that's actually a little bit later than I was thinking. I was like, he'll yeah. figure it out by the time he's four, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe maybe it was earlier than that, because um, I guess you're ten when you're in fourth grade. So yeah, I was probably I was probably seven or eight years old when I when I knew maybe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Filing this away. This is very important stuff here. Oh yeah. Okay, and then, uh, yeah. So they're allowed to watch anything at fifteen, but Die Hard is like—is that could they watch Die Hard when they were ten? No, no. And I, you know, I think we worry more about um, <laughs> if there's like adult, you know, violence is one thing, but like drug use and like any kind of like any adult things that you don't want them to see at that age is inappropriate, bad language, even bad language. And I'd rather my kids watch nightmare on Elm street than, um, something with drugs in it, you know, or mm. uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I like to watch my kids love horror movies. So when Halloween comes around, they want to watch all the horror movies. Um, oh, and gosh. it's funny. You'll watch, some, you'll watch something and, uh, I remember watching one movie and I thought it was the creepiest thing in the world. And my kids were like, oh, that's nothing. Like, you saw that movie? Who lets you see that movie? And now it's just, now it's just kids are exposed to every, everything now. They just, I'm just glad my kids are responsible and they're not, uh, they haven't turned out to be, you know, crazy kids. They're great. I, uh, I still can't uh, watch Gremlins. 
I was no. like <laughs> terrified as a, a little kid and yeah. I just, I can't go back to it. No, yeah. uh-uh. I just had to rewatch Tremors recently. Again, husband made me rewatch it. I can't do oh, horror yeah. movies, okay? Wow. I will have nightmares. Wow. Uh, and Tremors, uh, my adrenaline was pounding way more than it should have been. Wow. You know, there's some good, there, there's, there's a, check out the Babadook. I think that's one of my favorite um, newer, well, it's not new. It's probably, I don't know, eight years old or something, but that's a good, good one. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm like, oh gosh, I'll probably find some way to have a nightmare about it. Well, okay. Last, last question from you or for you from me uh-huh. is what do you think the best thing and the worst thing are? I guess it's really two questions about your profession. And we're expanding this to be vocalist, guitarist, musician, performing, performing musician, songwriter included. Yeah. The best thing is being to being able to be creative and having a fan base that's uh, going to take in your music and turn something that's intangible into something that means so much to them. You know, I love creating things. If I'm not uh, um, writing songs to me is, is my favorite thing to do other than hang out with my family, you know? Um, if that was taken away from me, I wouldn't, I'd feel like an empty person. That's, that's just what I've done for so long. And I've always been in a battle to save that because I always thought going into this business, getting into this, that being a creative person is a precious job. There's always a million people behind you trying to do the same thing. So who knows how long you're going to have that fan base that's going to listen to what you create. So mm-hmm. for my whole career, I've been trying to write and write and write to preserve that ability to write. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's very precious to me, is that creativity. That to me is the best thing. Um, the worst thing is being away from family, 100%, no question about it. That's, uh, I've done, I think I've done a good job at being very, me and my kids are super, super tight. Um, uh, you know, FaceTime now is a dream come true for us, you know, because you get to see everybody every day. Um, I was always good about getting my family to come out on tour since we had the baby that's changed a little bit. But she was a COVID baby. So I was home for her first whole year of life, you know, which was great. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's that's that's by far the toughest thing my family is by by far the most important thing if they told me dad i don't want you to tour anymore i'd probably be like guys i can't tour anymore (laughs) and you have some very very clear priorities and that's great yeah absolutely (laughs) absolutely all right well everybody uh go go buy this christmas album christmas classics new and old i got that right right yes yeah it's (laughs) called it's called mark tremonti christmas classics new and old and uh, there is some sweet, sweet schmoozy singing on it that you might not have expected from your favorite rocker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's Christmas songs. I love Christmas songs. I want to do volume eight of, of Christmas. There's so many of them. I'm here for it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, me awesome. too. Awesome. <laughs> Beautiful. And thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Wish you all the happy holidays and thank you. Cheers. Happy holidays. See you. Thank you so much. Cheers. <laughs> Yay.